Good evening and welcome. Tonight is the second of two nights that we have set aside to hear from the community on the superintendent's fiscal year 2022 operating budget proposal to the Board of Education. As always, board members are looking forward to hearing and giving thoughtful consideration to your input as we prepare to review and take action on the superintendent's recommendations. In light of the ongoing pandemic, this hearing and all testimonies will be conducted virtually this year. Tonight's hearing will be broadcast live on television and MCPS media, including the MCPS Spanish YouTube channel. As always, board members are looking forward to hearing and giving thoughtful consideration to your input as we prepare to review and take action on the superintendent's recommendations. Before we begin, let me allow members to introduce themselves, starting with our vice president, Ms. Silvestri. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carla Silvestri, school board member at large. Ms. O'Neill. Good evening, Pat O'Neill, District 3. Dr. Daka. Good evening, Judy Daka, District 1. Ms. Mandrowski. Hi, good evening, Rebecca Smondrowski, District 2. Ms. Harris. Good evening, everybody at large. Mr. Asante. Good evening, Nick Asante, student member of the board. And I'm Brenda Wolf, District 5. At this time, I'm going to ask the MCPS staff to please introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Smith. Good evening, Jack Smith, Superintendent. Good evening, Moni from the night, the superintendent. Thanks for joining us. Okay, is Hi. that everyone? Hi, we... Karen Stratman, Chief of Staff. Good evening. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, okay. Karen, our Chief of Engagement, Innovation, and Operations. Janet Wilson, Chief of Teaching, Learning, and Schools. Hello, it's Dan Morella, Associate Superintendent for Finance. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have other MCPS staff listening in on the call. The order of speakers is listed on the agenda that is available on the board's website. Board members will have the opportunity to hear from the community via either written, audio, or video presentations. Only the audio and video testimonies received will be aired during this meeting. Written testimonies of those who signed up for tonight's hearing have been made available to the public and for board members review on board docs. The board's remaining work sessions on the operating budget request will be held at 10 a.m. on Thursday, January the 21st, and on Monday, January the 25th, we will take tentative action on the proposed operating budget on Tuesday, February the 23rd, during the board's regularly scheduled meeting. So let's begin. Our first speaker is Mayor Bridget Newton and Council Member Monique Ashton from the City of Rockville. I'm Bridget Donald Newton, Mayor of the City of Rockville. And I'm Council Member Monique Ashton of the City of Rockville. Good evening, President Wolf and members of the board. On behalf of the Rockville Mayor and Council, Council Member Ashton and I would like to share our perspective on the Superintendent's recommended FY22 operating budget. We request that the board fully fund this continuity of services budget. The Mayor and Council support all county schools receiving the necessary resources to help students thrive academically, emotionally, and socially. The city will also share insight related to specific needs in our local community. We recognize and thank the board and superintendent for your leadership to implement distance learning during a surging global pandemic, while at the same time planning for the eventual return of our students to the classroom. Additionally, we are grateful for the incredible work that the school system has done to provide food at, at its meal sites to any school-aged county student in need during this very difficult time. A superior education for all students served by MCPS schools in Rockville 
and across the county, including early childhood learning, is a high priority of the Rockville Mayor and Council. The impacts of distance learning are beginning to emerge. Recent data from MCPS indicates increased educational disparities. More students are falling behind in math and English, especially those who are English language learners in special education and Hispanic and African American students in poverty. Now more than ever, it is critical that students are served by a full complement of teachers and support professionals. We are concerned that staffing allocations have been adjusted downward for ESOL, special education, and other key positions due to the reduced enrollment. This approach is insufficient to support student needs, including approximately 2,500 to 3,000 students that are projected to return post-pandemic. Therefore, we request that ESOL, special education, and other positions be frozen at the current staffing allocations for at least FY21 and FY22 in schools that serve all students across the county. Greeting, greetings, President Wolf and members of the board. Unfortunately, the unprecedented global pandemic has caused upheaval in the lives of students and families. Economic uncertainty and isolation and disconnection from traditional school activities is causing social and emotional distress, especially for vulnerable students in underserved communities. We support the superintendent's recommendation to increase mental health counselor support in middle and high schools, and we thank the board for approving an increase in elementary school resources in FY21. The city endorses the recommendation to add six school psychologists, and we believe that each school should have access. Additionally, the city supports the recommendation to add two parent community coordinators in schools with high farms rates. Beyond mental health supports, we know our students will need additional academic support to help overcome the gaps experienced during virtual learning. Over the past year, we have seen declining test scores, especially among low-income and minority students. <coughs> in schools in Rockville, the number of farms-eligible students was somewhat reduced due to parent challenges with registration, and some parents sought food support through meal distribution sites, which may not be reflected in the farm's data. Since Title I funds are determined by farm's data, we request that MCPS adjust the per pupil allocation to a level that will keep our funding stable. Our schools can afford to lose critical staff as a result of the global pandemic and distance learning. The Mayor and Council respectfully request the establishment of a linkages to learning site at Twinbrook Elementary School. There are crisis level needs that must be addressed. For example, in FY 2019, school counselor data indicate a staggering 892 individual meetings with students. There were also 28 student case referrals to the County Crisis Center for self-harm. Rockville re recently received a $50,000 grant from the County's Department of Health and Human Services to provide student counseling at the school. We are thankful to MCPS and the county for recognizing the school as a high need site and hope this creates a pathway for a Tornbrook Elementary School Linkages to Learning program. We can replicate the successes of the city-operated program at Maryvale at Tornbrook Elementary School. It would really help students to thrive by providing vital support and wraparound services that integrate academics, health, and social services. In closing, we thank you for this opportunity and all that you've done this past year. The FY22 budget context is challenging with fiscal uncertainty at the county and state and preparing for the future return of students to the classroom. Please let us know how we can support your advocacy at the state and county for MCPS funding to provide our children with the superior educational programming they deserve. Thank you. And next we will have Adia Parna from Poolsville High School. Dr. Smith and esteemed members of the Montgomery County Board of Education. My name is Avia Parna and I'm a sophomore at Poolsville High School. Imagine you're walking down the hallways of a public high school. You're coming out of class. Now the bell is ringing from the speakers. It triggers you and your brain goes into hyperstimulation. An SRO officer sees you and the first thing they think of is that you are a menace to the school. 
So what do they do? They pin you down. And you scream now that you're subject to physical violence, but you can't escape because your pleas for help are comprehended as vicious. Today, I wish to speak about a matter that should have risen when the first neurodivergent student was physically assaulted by the same system that was supposed to protect students from the same assault. Creating a new training program for SRO officers to learn how to treat neurodivergent or special needs students. In February 2015, Maryland passed SB 853 to increase training for, for members of Maryland law enforcement regarding the needs of those with developmental and intellectual disabilities. The public was ecstatic to see that Maryland had restored some equity to the relationship between those with neurodiversity and the Maryland police. Now, two county council members and I have proposed that SRO officers in Montgomery County develop the skills needed to treat students with special needs. Despite the support of a majority of Montgomery County students and administration, our proposal was called out by the opposition as a pork barrel to budgeting, infringement on regular students, and a waste of time. This couldn't be further from the truth. Fairfax, Baltimore, Frederick, and Williamsburg James City County, along with the Kennedy Krieger Institute, have all instituted training programs for SRO officers in neurodivergence. The best part is that these programs decrease SRO violence by 46.4% according to CRS. And so it is imperative we do what is deemed as an act of unmitigated humanity by the U.S. Department of Justice. The DC and Maryland WJLA news station found that 61.7% of Montgomery County parents with neurodivergent children are afraid of the untrained SRO officers. 61.7% of over 30,000 parents and yet ignored. A majority and yet ignored. These students will not be able to learn in the same environment as other students whose mental stability has not been violated by an SRO officer on behalf of the family and friends who struggle for another day of these students' survival in our educational system. I am heartbroken. As NCJRS claims that SRO violence is one of the top issues facing the educational system today, it is saddening how we fail to take to bring educational equity to students who depend on us for justice after being taken advantage of year after year. Let's make MCPS a county that stands at the forefront of this issue. So now I ask you, as you decide the best use of the proposed funding of $2.7 billion, can't we make an investment for a good cause rather than declining the right to equal education and mental wellness? Thank you. Next, we will have Eleanor Clements Cope and Rosa Clements Cope from Richard Montgomery High School and Pyle Middle School. Hi, I'm Eleanor Clemenscope, a junior at Virtual Montgomery. And I'm Mercy Clemenscope, a seventh grader at Pine Middle School. We're both part of the Sunrise Rockville hub of the Sunrise Movement, and we're here to testify for climate justice and educational equity in MCPS. First, MCPS currently buys dirty energy, funding fossil fuel systems that are destroying their students' futures. It is so easy and so important to switch to buying renewable energy. We also heard that MCPS will start a small contract with electric bus companies next year. And that's a good baby step towards reducing MCPS's greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution that's been harming our communities. But it's also critical that MCPS electrify much more of their fleet much more quickly to save their students' futures, because we only have nine years left to reach net zero emissions. Another critical goal for MCPS is racial and educational equity, but school resource officers create a hostile learning environment, especially for black and brown students and disabled students, and SROs are a big part of the school to prison pipeline for those students. The disparities are massive. 45% of school-based arrests in 2018-2019 were of black students, though they make up 22% of the student population. And 25% of school-based arrests were of students with disabilities or IEPs, though they make up only 12% of the student population. Climate justice, racial justice, and justice for disabled people are all interconnected, and we stand in solidarity with MOCO Against Brutality to say that SROs have to go. Next, we're going to talk about climate curriculum. I've been in MCPS from kindergarten through 11th grade, so I know what you teach about the climate. The curriculum touches very briefly on the greenhouse effect and impacts on animals. Some MCPS documents delicately mention climate change. But in the classroom, there's almost nothing on the crisis. Some of the science I was provided in elementary school from Scholastic was even funded by the coal industry. Why is MCPS telling lies to its students? 
We need to know the science so that we can fight for our futures. We demand that we add real climate education to the science curriculum for every grade level. And we demand that education tells us about both the science of the crisis and about the corporate and government systems that enable it. This is a responsibility that you have to your students. It is critical that our community and this school system lead in ending the climate catastrophe. And CPS can and must be a model for community leadership. We're asking for electrification of MCPS energy, removing SROs to further equity in schools, and a real climate curriculum. Because climate change is not just fueling fires in California and floods in the Midwest, climate change is happening right here in Montgomery County. Scientists say that Maryland's climate is rapidly becoming like Mississippi, hotter, wetter, floodier, and buggier. Our community's health is at risk, and your students' futures are on the line. Thank you. Next, we will have Lainey Parker from Lakeland Park Middle School. Hello, my name is Lainey Parker, a student at Lakeland Park Middle School, and I will be providing testimony in support for switching to green energy. The Board of Education must switch to buying renewable energy for to power their buildings and transition to electric buses to transport their students. I'm not here today to give you a bunch of statistics proving that green energy is the better option because that has already been proven. I'm here today to take a stand for our communities and explain why it is crucial that you, the school board, make this change. I'm here today because I need to be. Unfortunately, your students, my generation, are the people who are hurt most by your choice to continue investing in dirty energy. I'm standing here because it is imperative that we make this switch to green energy and electric buses not only to help save our planet, but also to improve local public health because of improvements in air quality. Pollution from dirty energy and diesel buses is causing asthma and other health problems in our community, and communities of color and poor communities are hit the hardest. It is up to us to decide whether or not we want to save our next few generations. And it may seem like we have all the time in the world, but we absolutely do not. We have nine years left to cut more than half of greenhouse gas emissions. And MCPS needs to be a leader in green energy, not a climate villain. Green energy will improve the health of our people, lower the demands for natural gases and coal, and generate energy that produces no greenhouse gases. You, the board, get to make the final decision here. But we, the students, don't work for you. You work for us. Your job is to provide us with an education and a bright future. We will never have those unless we make the necessary changes now. If you really do love these students, then help guarantee them a safe and healthy future. Without changes like switching to green energy in Montgomery County Public Schools, there is no guarantee of a future for students like myself. We cannot wait until tomorrow. The change needs to come now, and it is up to you to save your students. Thank you for your time. Next, we have Philippe DeBow from Walt Whitman Dear High members School. of the board, first of all, I would like to thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Felipe Debole and I'm a junior at Walt Whitman High School and a member of MCRSGA. I'm speaking to you today to urge you not to cut any funds from the ESOL program and if possible to expand its funding. I know that MCPS has cut its budget for the next school year due to decreased revenue resulting from the pandemic, but it is vital that funds for ESOL do not get taken away. The ESOL program is already underfunded as it is when compared to other subgroups within the service group dollars category of the budget with almost 10 times more money being allocated to per each special education student than per each ESOL student, as described by a 2019 report. Special education programs in MCPS are undoubtedly important and require funding, but so does ESOL. We cannot cut funding that would benefit ESOL students who, according to the same report, had a four-year dropout rate of 36.3% and a four-year graduation rate of 46.6% in 2018 the lowest out of any cohort included in the study. I was an ESOL student in my first two years in MCPS. When I came here in 2014, I did not speak any English, but with the help of the ESOL program, I was able to, in six months, almost be able to test out of the program. 
of course, I had many things on my side that other ESOL students don't have, such as parents who spoke English. Nevertheless, I have experienced firsthand, firsthand the instrumental role that the ESOL program can have in ESOL students' learning careers. For both of the years I was in the ESOL program, however, I was able to see how it could be improved. I was placed in classes where there were students of many levels, which made the instruction not be as individually based as it could have been. With more funding for ESOL, this could be made more feasible, whether it is through the hiring of more ESOL teachers or the, or the recruitment of assistant staff. As students hopefully come back to in-person school in the fall of 2021, the ESOL program is going to be faced with challenges it has never had to face before. I can, I, speaking from experience, can say that being surrounded by English for seven hours a day went such a long way um, for helping me learn the language. Students in ESOL right now don't have that constant exposure that I and many other ESOL students have had. And so they will require increased assistance and increased support in the next school year, specialized increased support. As you decide on how to allocate funding for different, for, for different programs for the next year, a school year that will surely be much different from any that we've ever had before, I urge you to consider the importance of the ESOL program, especially given the current situation, and maintain or expand its funding. Thank you. Next is Katie Ewen from Richard Montgomery High School. Good afternoon, Ms. Wolf and members of the Board of Education. My name is Katie Yuen and I'm a junior at Richard Montgomery High School. Today, I'm here to talk about an issue that has been overlooked by educational systems around the world, and MCPS is no exception. Our current school systems teaches us math, English, history, but simply neglects to teach us perhaps the most important subject, personal finance, teaching students how to make smart financial decisions. Students exiting high schools simply cannot thrive in today's economy without a strong understanding in money. According to studies by New America, student loans have soared to over 620 billion in mid, in mid 2019. Over 40% of Americans have said they have zero dollars in retirement savings, while 45% say that they will likely run out of money in retirement. Young adults are burdened with this exorbitant loans right out of high school without sufficient financial knowledge of how to deal with it. Unexpected events in 2020 have shown us exactly how important personal finance education is, especially when the economy is simply out of our control. 10 years ago, the Maryland State Board of Education required school systems in Maryland to integrate personal finance into curriculums, and MCPS decided to incorporate this into the NSL government course via the Ever Five Financial Literacy course for high schools. All students I've talked to have never heard of such a program, nor have they felt they learned anything about personal finance in class. And even if it was taught at some point in other schools, the module offered is only four hours long and is simply not adequate enough to prepare us for the real financial world. Furthermore, there is a huge disparity in accessibility to SID courses between MCPS high schools with business academies versus schools where the only distantly related course is perhaps AP economics. The lack of equitable access to personal finance educational opportunities has been a growing concern among students across the country. Just a few months ago, Prince George's County, with a unanimous vote, adopted personal finance graduation requirement for the 2023-2024 school year. And if finances are a concern, the state of Maryland has shown that support from nonprofit organizations, credit unions, and investment companies have resulted in Virginia not having to make a single financial contribution. Members of the Board of Education, as you're considering the operating budget for the 2022 school year, we sincerely ask you to follow other Maryland counties in creating a personal finance graduation requirement and striving for a more equitable education system for all. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we will take questions from the board. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on with our, oh, Ms. Sil Ms. Silvestri, go ahead. 
Um, just for the sake of our listening audience, um, Dr. McKnight, could you expand on um, the reasoning behind the ESOL cuts? Thank you, Ms. Silvestri. So in terms of the ESOL cuts, I would say we really looked at the ESOL alignment. And, and so as you know, if you've been following MCPS and how we're supporting our ESOL students over the past few years, we've had a number of structures that have existed and um, you know, just taking the time to step back and look at them to figure out what is it that we're yielding as a result from those structures. Previously, we did a big change in looking at uh, um, how do we not silo our ESOL students and the programs that they're having access for and how do we expand that? And a part of uh, what we see in terms of alignment in this budget really is not particularly cutting a lot of, um, or cutting access to the needs in the school for our ESOL students, but more realigning of services. So I think that's something that we can uh, make more clear or more specific so that our, um, our community can better understand that. And also, I think as we continue to roll out how those alignments fit into a bigger vision of how we're supporting our students, the community will be able to make some better connections to that. So I think that, that, that the testimony is actually uh, were very helpful in really looking at how there may be some, some misunderstanding to those pieces that we should uh, make sure we clarify. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, Chris Lloyd from the Montgomery County Education Association. Good evening. One year and six days ago, I testified before you regarding the budget. None of us could imagine that just two months from that date, everything would change. Last year, I started with a quote from James Baldwin, which reads, everything now, we must assume, is in our own hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we do not falter in our duty now, we may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. How one year and six days can change the context of this quote. How one year and six days can change how we talk about public education. I believe we stand at a crossroads. There are so many institutions that are threatened, but the one institution, the one structure that is our foundation for every other institution is public education. And it too is facing existential threats. So what we do now, in this time, history will record. It is a heavy weight as leaders that we bear. Prior to the pandemic, we had the highest child poverty rate of any industrialized country in the world. Children homeless, food insecure, with no health insurance. 46 million children who in a year's time experience violence, abuse, or neglect. Linda Darling Hammond calls it aggressive neglect of our children. The pandemic has made this much, much worse. And so we seek to address what we can do as a school system through community schools, social and emotional supports for our babies, ensuring racial and social justice, and honoring the teaching profession. We must confront now more than ever if we are willing to invest in other people's children as we struggle with the challenge of individualism versus community. In a culture that many times stresses competition, individual success and political and economic power over common good, that's the frame we now enter for public institutions. How we chart this debate charts the fate of our community. If a community supports its schools and those who serve children in them, then this process is relatively easy because people fight for public dollars, for great public schools, for the public good. And if a community cannot support its schools and those who serve children, then public schools atrophy, resulting in fewer public dollars for a declining cycle of public schools where individual good is prioritized over public good. That's why we support the superintendent's budget. 
it is needed now more than ever because the work we must do is daunting. We must advocate for what we need this year and next year and the following. Kerwin provides the blueprint, but it does no good unless we implement it. Almost three years of research and hearings and study resulted in the landmark findings. But if they sit on a shelf now, we will never know what we have missed. Everything now, we must assume, is in our own hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. The next six months is critical in so many ways, and we must rise to meet the challenge. I know we will. Thank you for your work and for your fight in the coming days for the children and educational professionals in this community. Next up is Christine Handy for speaking on behalf of McCat. Good evening, Ms. Wolf, Ms. Silvestri, members of the Board of Education, and Dr. Smith. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the superintendent's recommended operating budget for fiscal year 2022. I am Dr. Christine Handy, president of the Montgomery County Association of Administrators and Principals, MACAP, and Montgomery County Business and Operations Administrators, MCBOA. Our organization represents over 750 leaders who serve in administrative and supervisory positions in schools and central services. We have had the opportunity to work in partnership with our fellow association partners, MCEA and SEIU Local 500 and the MCPS executive staff to discuss the superintendent's recommended operating budget. This will be a challenging fiscal year, and at this time, we are not fully aware of the funding that we will receive from the state and the county. MCPS executive staff has worked diligently to produce a budget that maximizes our existing resources and recognizes the contributions of our employees. In addition, it also takes into consideration that next year, we will be facing significant challenges to recover the learning losses of our students due to the impact of the current pandemic. As Dr. Smith has frequently stated, we must be united for our future. We recognize that there is uncertainty with regard to the impact of decreased enrollment, revenue projections for the state of Maryland and Montgomery County and Kerwin funding. In his budget overview, Dr. Smith made two statements. The most important investment in any year is made to support MCPS staff. Maintaining a quality staff for the future is critical as they are the heart of our community. We wholeheartedly agree. Given this, should monies become available, I would like to call your attention to two items that are not included in the fiscal year 22 budget at this time. We feel these items are essential to maintaining quality staff, supporting our schools with the resources they need, and compensating employees in order to be competitive with our neighboring school districts and the cost of living. Over the years, we have been consistently advocating for MCPS to enhance school leadership and administrative staffing. In order for our members to provide the instructional leadership required of school leaders today, and to implement the MCPS professional growth systems with fidelity, we must increase leadership staffing in our schools. We are advocating for the conversion of assistant school administrators to assistant principals and for the addition of assistant principals at our elementary and special schools. Last year, prior to the pandemic, MCPS budgeted for three new assistant principal positions and the conversion of five assistant school administrators to 12-month assistant principal positions for middle and high schools. It is imperative that we have strong administrative teams to handle the complex work that is required for them to lead the learning and build positive school cultures while managing the day-to-day -day operations of a complex school community. This requires a team, not working in isolation. Lastly, prior to the pandemic, the initial budget included a 3% cost of living increase and a step in compensation for all employees. It was quite evident once the pandemic struck the nation 
that resources were going to be redirected to fully implement a robust virtual education. Thus, employees had to forego any increase in compensation while working to teach, serve, and lead in ways that they had never done before. Unless you have experience leading, teaching, and establishing a robust virtual education, it's difficult to appreciate the complexity and challenges. Yet our employees have worked hard, developed new skills and pedagogy, and have had to lead like they have never had to before. If monies become available, we ask you to compensate MCPS employees with cost of living and step increases to show the value of their work and to attract and retain a high quality workforce. The recovery from this pandemic is going to take time. We acknowledge the work of MCPS leadership on the operating budget and appreciate their commitment to keep the system whole. We appreciate you, the Board of Education, and Dr. Smith as our partners on this journey. We look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you for your time. Next is Cynthia Simonson, MCC PTA President. Hi, I'm Cynthia Simonson, MCC PTA President. The mission of the PTA is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. Clearly, addressing our students' recovery from this global pandemic remains at the forefront of every conversation and this budget. Respectfully, we should have the students' recovery advancing in this education as our highest priority. MCC PTA cluster coordinators have been providing testimony last week and this week on the many specific areas of need. I wanna hit three key points that are overarching in any recovery budget. First, now is the time to hold school-based staffing in place. While enrollment may decrease, and we might have be tempted to reduce the allocations, the need for site-based staff will be greater than ever. Consistent with MCC PTA priorities, we advocate for this budget to prioritize resources to cohorts of students who are experiencing significant learning loss and mental health distress. We often talk about how most of our funds in this budget is related to staffing. I question whether even holding firm at the current staffing levels is enough. I asked Dr. Smith and the Board of Education to consider how central office can help in the vineyard during this recovery period, at least for a portion of their day. It took me aback to hear someone recently laud the number of board certified teachers we have working out of central office. It makes me pause. It reminds me of an effort a few years ago that quickly fell away, initiated by the Board of Education to have central office staff substitute teach, in part so they were directly connected to the realities of our schools. I wonder if this recovery period is an opportunity to look at models where principals and assistant principals teach a class each day. I'm asking if in this budget, we adjust our staffing to assign small groups of students who need academic interventions to central office staff who might start their work day in a neighborhood elementary school, ideally in an outdoor learning space. What if central office staff were supplementing academic counseling? I'm just always amazed at the breadth of experience of our central office staff, and especially how many leaders in our system have special education expertise. In a period of recovery, these are the students that need these amazing educators the most. My challenge to you is to think about what operations we can adjust. Second, this budget must take into account the time and attention needed for students to repeat courses. And like a few years ago, there's summer school and there is summer school. MCPS offers summer school, regionally located with a variety of options, largely focused on recovery credits. And students, regardless of homeschool, can pay the fee and take a course on a space available basis. Then we have schools that run their own summer school, only for students that are in the boundaries of that school. I watched as the board opposed a legislative bill uh, January 12th that would eliminate fees for summer school. I challenge this board to look closely at the practices of our schools. Ask MCPS to provide a comprehensive account of what has occurred with summer school in pre-pandemic years and ensure that this budget addresses the disparities that were so apparent from the practice. If they don't have it, that information readily available, you let me know, and I'll gladly ask the PTAs to gather this information. 
Finally, in a public education system, clear communication is imperative. We've come a long way in how we communicate with our families. However, we are still a system filled with best kept secrets. Understanding how the system works should not be reliant on who you know. If parents understood what to expect of public education, they could better determine what items are outside the norm and the pathway to raise the concerns. Parents who go to appeal a school-based decision are often at a loss, dependent on social media, because there is no office in MCPS dedicated to help support parents' concerns. Parents who want to understand how their children compare are frustrated by dashboards that don't allow access to corresponding data to run any true analysis. Why is the data so hard to access? In the MCCPTA advocacy priorities, we ask for clear and accurate communications, substantial outreach, and transparency around reporting. If this budget doesn't allocate resources for a dedicated ombudsman, and if this budget does not finally create the mechanisms so that when possible, data is released in accessible data files, then we ask you to go back and sharpen the pencils in your deliberations. We have tremendous opportunity to change the way public education is delivered. One of our high school namesakes is credited with saying, we should never let a good crisis go to waste. Indeed. I thank you for your time and your service to our students. Dr. Smith, I wish you well in your retirement, and I'm attaching our full list of advocacy priorities for your reference. Thank you. Next, we have Sarah Cortez from Walter Johnson High School Cluster. President Wolf, Superintendent Smith, and members of the board. I am Sierra Cortez and I am proud to represent the Walter Johnson Cluster in testifying to you on the Cluster's operating budget needs. In preparation for today's testimony, I look back on the operating budget testimony I submitted to you at the beginning of 2020. As I did so, a single and powerful question kept coming up for me. How was this only a year ago? This exercise illuminated for me the challenges of budget planning, particularly budgeting for the operating and staffing needs of a large and dynamic system. There will always be challenges right in front of us that demand our attention and action. And yet, there is always a need to be planning ahead, to be looking around corners, and importantly, to recognize that we cannot always know what lies ahead of us. We can, however, lay a solid foundation so that we can face the unexpected on the best footing possible. In that regard, we were heartened to hear Superintendent Smith reiterate a theme from the fall CIP discussions, that the decrease in enrollment that we have seen this year during virtual school is temporary, that students will be returning, and that they will need to plan accordingly. Not only will these additional students return, but all our students and staff will be facing unprecedented needs as hopefully we begin to heal physically and emotionally from this pandemic. Of course, we must continue to make decisions facing us in the current unique school year, but it is imperative that we look ahead beyond the current crisis to how we will repair the educational, social, and emotional gaps this pandemic has caused. Accordingly, while no one wants to see a year-to-year -year budget reduction, we thank MCPS for requesting a budget well above the required maintenance of effort calculation based on the current year's diminished enrollment. We also recognize that MCPS will be facing budgetary pressures from both the state and county council. Finally, we appreciate the superintendent's recognition that this budget is a snapshot in time and that it will likely be amended as the volatile picture of both the system's needs and the system's sources of funding change. We are prepared for such changes and we look forward to working with MCPS on the details of this operating budget as the financial situation becomes more clear. And you have our commitment that we will continue to advocate this MC MCPS, its staff and students need our investment now more than ever. In terms of the specific needs we face, we urge MCPS to review staffing levels and increase staffing to support the needs of our students. The WJ cluster was short on counselors before 2020, and the pandemic and virtual environment have increased that need. As we have testified in the past, large schools such as those in the Walter Johnson cluster can be particularly disadvantaged under the current allocation formulas. The social and emotional struggles of our students and their families during the pandemic exacerbated the effects of this counselor shortage. In nearly all of our schools, the refrain is the same. Our counselors are amazing and they're being taxed to be on their limit. 
We therefore urge MCPS to provide more counselors and continue to work toward reaching the ASCA benchmark of a counselor for every 250 students. We also are requesting extra support in the classroom, whether virtual or in-person, specifically additional paraeducators, reading specialists, and math specialists can help to lower learning group sizes in the classroom and help make up for losses from the past year. Additional paraeducators are also needed when we return to school to help keep our large student population safe during the lunch and recess periods. Finally, we ask that you continue to support and invest in the professional development of our teachers. So many of our teachers have done amazing work to reinvent the way they teach during this time, which was made even more challenging through the introduction of new curriculum. Planning for robust professional development will benefit teachers and provide needed support as they face the daunting task of helping our kids recover some of what they've lost. The Montgomery County community has faced a decade's worth of challenges in the past year, and we will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. No matter what the budgetary pressures from the county or the state, we ask that you continue to stand strong for the needed investment in our, in our public schools, and we pledge to do the same. Thank you. Next is Melissa Re Regan and Kathy Fusto from Seneca Valley High School Cluster. Good evening, Board of Education members, Superintendent Smith, and MCPS staff. I'm Kathy Fusto testifying on behalf of the Seneca Valley Cluster Schools. Pre-pandemic, this testimony would have been about equitably dispersed programming so that access can be maximized. It would probably have included information regarding funding needed to repair broken musical instruments. You would have heard about bus tracking software. This testimony would have ended with a giant thank you for all the new programs at the new Seneca Valley High School so that students up county could participate in programs similar to those at Thomas Edison down in Wheaton. What we have now are budgets significantly impacted by COVID, consequences reaching far and wide. Everyone from companies, school systems, restaurants, and retail and yes, families with students, are trying to hang on and weather the financial losses. Funds are being redirected to PPE, technology, and air cleaners for staff and students to even begin the next phase of instruction. Operationally, we need to focus on getting the basics back in place. For student basics, this means programming and curriculum that is solid from pre-K all through 12th grade. Are the needs being met for ESOL students, special education students, highly able students, students that get good grades in AP and IB classes, then flunk the tests, traumatized students, and non-traumatized students? How do we really know? When learning loss is analyzed, let's make sure that we know what we need to know about every student. A lot more of our families need food, MiFi, help navigating systems, both technological and systemic. How do we accomplish this? We need to talk to every student and their guardians. We need to have conversations, not surveys. For parent basics, this means communication. MCPS has a lot of resources, both in-house and out in the community. Too many parents don't know about them or can't find them. We could take this time to think about where and how information is kept and how it's sent out. A Germantown parent couldn't find information in reference to their LGBTQ student and contacted our cluster coordinator. To find the guidelines, we started with the tab for students, but couldn't find them, then tried middle high and didn't see them, even in the student life section. We put LGBTQ in the search bar, which gave a variety of responses, of course. Guidelines were about midway down the page in the results, but after opening the PDF, tiny print along the bottom listed 2018. Luckily, this was spotted and there was a realization that the first guidelines in the search were from three years ago and are not current. 
This can't be the way that people find things. A central repository for information is overdue. Archive outdated content and add topical information under the tabs. Oh, it's not just the parents that use this website to access information. The Bethesda Beat reporter who wrote an article in reference to a lawsuit filed Friday, January 8th against MCPS linked the inaccurate, outdated guidelines accidentally spreading misinformation. For staff basics, this means professional development. How do we utilize the staff development teacher, counselors, administration, teachers, support staff, all located in every school, to deliver enriching training for every staff mem member in the building on topics like social emotional learning, equity, relationship building, inclusivity, and affirmation of all students, restorative justice, parent engagement, Be Well 365, social justice, student voice, and more. And expanding and organizing the district-wide PDO system for more options. Let's make these available for staff, students, and families and share with each other. Our community of staff and parents have an incredible amount of knowledge. Would there be folks that would want to create meaningful trainings on important subject matters? Yes, I'm sure of it. We always want more staff and more program to craft the ideal public school system possible. But in these times, let's get back to basics. Solidify the foundation for students family, and all staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening. Next, we have K Carrie Primusik from Gatesburg High School Cluster. Thank you to the Board of Education, Ms. Wolf, Dr. Smith, and MCPS. I am Carrie Primusik. I'm one of the MCC PTA Gaithersburg Cluster coordinators. I would like to start by sharing a bit about our Gaithersburg cluster. Our 10 PTA boards have met regularly over the past couple years to share best practices and form relationships across the cluster. Since the pandemic, we started having parent meetings for all Gaithersburg cluster parents to connect, support each other, and share ideas. This past fall, we had two meetings, one in English with 25 parents attending and one in Spanish with 23 parents attending. In these meetings, parents shared positive experiences and concerns related to their children and their education here at MCPS. We had nine out of 10 schools represented at these meetings and we had many new faces. Here are some highlights from these meetings. Of course, there was talk of our current distance learning. There was a connection among parents of gratitude for all the hard work our teachers are putting in for our students. Some feel their children are making progress and at the same time, some were concerned about too many assignments for our middle school and high school students, while some expressed concern around the longevity of distance learning. With that said, there were many parents who felt keeping their children home and safe right now was for the best. There was a real desire for clarity on safety procedures for when our students do reunite in our school buildings. There were concerns around how school will actually look when we go back. Gaithersburg parents would benefit from clear expectations on logistics involved when we return to some sense of in-person school. There were concerns around using technology, internet issues, tech support, and using parent view. Our Gaithersburg parents care, and we want to know how to easily access information for our children. Continued efforts to reach our parents is so greatly appreciated. Our cluster has three priorities for the fiscal year 2022 operating budget, ESOL programs, special education programs, and staffing. I am sure we are not alone in this need. Our fellow clusters may also share this same need, and I hope we can be part of the message for the support of these needs throughout our county. 
we need all ESOL programs that are in place now to remain in place going forward. We have a rapidly growing ESOL population and this means we need to focus on these students. Our programs currently funded by the Kerwin funding need to remain in place. We need to keep our community school and we need to keep staffing for all of our programs as students move in and out of our cluster. It can change our enrollment numbers and depending on what time of year ESOL positions are looked at for staffing allocations can make a big difference in staffing. Careful attention to these numbers would help with staffing needs. We have many kids who are ESA level three and four who are mainstreamed in our general education classes, which is great and requires support staff. In preparation for this testimony, I reached out to our principals, PTAs, and parents. I learned about a fifth grade student who came to one of our schools who was still working at becoming literate in Spanish while also learning English. This requires a more intense type of ESOL support. And so you can see why we are passionate about keeping all our ESOL programming and staffing. I imagine the story of a fifth grader is not unique to our cluster and many other clusters can relate and benefit from the same type of attention to ESOL funding. Our special education programs and staffing is needed as well. Continued funding for all our current special education programming is necessary for our students to receive the services they require. Staffing is key. If we do not staff our schools with the needed teachers and support staff, then schools have to make adjustments and student services may not be provided effectively. Many of our students need ESOL and special education support and all of our students need proper staffing for success. We know our ESOL, special education programs, and proper staffing are valued here at MCPS. Thank you for your time and attention. We are trusting you to keep our top priorities in place for our students. Next is Kathy Stocker from Bethesda Chevy Chase Cluster. Dear Board President Wolf, Board of Education members and Superintendent Smith. Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony regarding the MCPS FY 2022 operating budget. My name is Kathy Stocker and along with my fellow BCC cluster coordinator, Tim Wolf, we welcome the opportunity to represent the families of the over 7,500 kids currently enrolled over our 10 schools. Thank you all for your service to our students and their families during these extraordinary times. We are realistic. We know that the fiscal pie is shrinking and we know that our request today cannot be too pie in the sky. This terrible pandemic has, in more ways than one, forced us all to grapple with the necessity of triaging, directing and committing limited resources where they are most needed. It is imperative that we fully fund the proposed budget, and in doing so, that we prioritize the populations of kids who are most at risk. As we analyze the proposed budget in general, we are concerned about how current enrollment may skew our enrollment projections for next year and our own cluster we know that current enrollment numbers are not typical, and we know that they are not a reliable indicator of what enrollment will look like next school year. We know parents postponed kindergarten. We know that parents withdrew their kids and made temporary arrangements elsewhere. And we know that those kids will be back. Let us not assume that they have withdrawn from the system permanently. Many of them will be coming back in an increased numbers. In our own cluster, we are confident that the enrollment will be higher, not only than this year, but last year. Let's plan for them and let's budget for them. We need to freeze staffing allocations at current levels in anticipation of a return to previous enrollment numbers. Turning our attention to more specific and acute needs addressed by the proposed budget, we want to urge the approval of funding for mental health supports. We agree with the proposal to locally fund the mental health coordinator currently funded through Coroin. While it is our goal to see a psychologist in every school next year, we understand that current fiscal restraints limit us to a more incremental approach. So please do not interrupt this progress and please move forward with funding for six more school psychologists. We cannot allow the pandemic to derail our efforts to bring the best restorative justice practices to our schools. Funding trainers who can, in, who can then in turn train our staff at individual schools is a smart approach in this proposed budget. As we grapple with what a return to normal looks like and take stock of how much we lost, 
we are not going to be surprised to learn that our most vulnerable kids lost the most. We are already seeing this in working period one data, despite the heroic efforts of our teachers, staff, administrators, families, and advocates, we know that the pandemic is impacting kids disproportionately. Last year, I and other cluster coordinators, teachers, and advocates brought before the board the pressing issue of the need for more full-time ESOL counselors, especially at schools that are MET sites. We need these counselors more than ever to help our kids who have already endured so much trauma even before COVID. And even from the point of view of fiscal prudency, investing in highly qualified counselors will yield a large and measurable return in keeping kids engaged in school and increasing our graduation rates in this population. One of the most deeply troubling effects of this pandemic is the extreme exacerbation of the achievement gap. It will take us years to make up lost ground if we, and if we do not strategically deploy and target resources as soon as possible to help these most vulnerable kids, we will lose even more. At BCC High School, we are in desperate need of a full-time ESOL counselor as we anticipate an increase both in our ESOL population and in our METS population. The pandemic and resulting necessity for virtual learning has also disproportionately impacted our students with IEPs and 504 plans. Many of you and many of us as advocates have heard truly heartbreaking stories about the frustration and despair felt by so many students and families across the county. Many of these families are hanging by a thread and just trying to hang in there until we can return to our school buildings. When these kids do return, they are going to need extra support, extra academic support and extra emotional support. Invest, investing in mental health resources and dedicated counseling specialists for special needs students with IEP and 504 plans is exactly that, an investment. Counselors will already have their hands full and do not have the time and availability they need to work with these students. So we encourage you to consider dedicating specialists to work with our special needs populations. I want to conclude by once again, thanking all of you and urging you to craft and approve this budget with a careful eye on the populations of kids who are most at risk. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today and thank you all for your service to our community. To you and yours, stay well and all the best. At, at this time, I'll take questions from the board. Uh, Ms. Madrowski. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I wanna say how much I appreciate everybody's testimonies. Um, couple of uh, things. Um, in particular, um, I know that this was something the central office staff filling in um, as substitutes or doing what they can um, to help out is something that we did bring up over the last few years. Um, I don't know if we're still looking at that, but I'd like to really strongly emphasize the um, the need for that and the fact that, you know, it, it's a, I think it's such a good idea. Um, I would like um, as a follow up. The um, total cost of transferring the um, admin um, folks in schools to assistant principals. I know we did, we've done many over the years, you know, in little bunches here and there as best we can, but I would like to know what the total cost would be to do the remaining um, of those. Um, I really want to thank the Seneca Valley Cluster testimony um, about the communication stuff. We really, you know, making sure that the basics are there and making sure that we're giving our staff, all of our staff, the professional development needed is so critical. Um, and my last question is um, financial literacy. Um, I'm curious if there is a summer school option for kids that missed Finance Park um, this year because of the pandemic. Um, is there something that at least gives the financial course or how are we dealing with, are, are we trying to figure out ways that once we are able to get back in person to make those classes, up, that, that situation up for our students? We have been continuing with Finance Park and a digital um, uh, strategy or digital platform. Uh, I think the question is to what degree is that uh, valuable and does it meet the need? And it's something that we're gonna have to continue to study. Uh, we'll go ahead and get the total cost of the ASA conversion to assistant principals uh, for you. Uh, we did. We do have central office people now currently teaching uh, one period in a building, and we also have central office uh, uh, folks who have subbed. We've tried that, but as you know, they all have full-time jobs, and so it does become a challenge yeah. whether or not you want to add more people 
so that they all work part time. One of the things, though, that uh, was mentioned in testimony is the Kerwin legislation or the blueprint for Maryland's future. And it really does call for and push on the idea that uh, that many, many people in the school system would be teaching at least part of each day. And I think that is something we're going to continue to see shift in the environment. And it's frankly a shift that I applaud and think that is is important and worthwhile. Uh, in terms of financial literacy, it is embedded in the elementary, middle, and high school, and we'll send you a follow-up so you know how it's currently done. In a portion of the state, it's also a half-credit class at high school level. I think it's a, about half the state does that, the other half embedded in courses uh, along the way. So we can send a follow-up to share with the board how that's handled. I appreciate that so much. And I, I totally understand about the, you know, our staff all have other jobs as well. But even I know just from myself volunteering in classrooms or, mm -hmm. you know, at lunch and stuff, it really does keep you connected in a way that you don't yes. get when you're not there. <laughs> so. Absolutely agree and understand. Uh, for my six years in Japan, I, I taught uh, one or two classes every day as the middle and high school principal and and think that's a very uh, important model for public education to consider. Okay, I saw Ms. O'Neill next and then Ms. Harris. Um, my question is about ESOL counselors because we, we hear this every year. How many ESOL counselors do we have at the secondary level and where are they located? And what type of training do we provide our other secondary counselors to address the needs of uh, ESOL students? Um, I realize they may not they may not be bilingual, but not all ESOL counselors are as well. So, um, can you give us the response? Absolutely, we will include that in in the follow up to the questions send those to the board and then also post those online so everybody will have access to them. Ms. Harris, go ahead. Yeah, just two quick questions. Um, I know we're looking at a lot of things when it comes to um, alleviating some of the academic burdens on students this year um, and among others, you know, pass fail courses and you know, allowing students more generous options for withdrawing. But building on Ms. Mondrowski's comment around um, Finance Park and the way we are have built that opportunity for seventh graders into our curriculum to meet the MSDE requirement for financial literacy instruction, as we're looking at summer courses, is there an opportunity for us to look at perhaps making a Finance Park option available for um, seventh graders that that can get to it. I know there, there could be a lot of sort of choreography involved because we have uh, 40 middle schools and about a third of them missed that opportunity last year and most of them are missing that opportunity this year. And then the other thing goes to, I just would like to appreciate the Seneca Valley testimony um, and this, this suggestion that I fully endorse that a lot of our stakeholders in our school communities have a lot to offer us when it comes to some of the training that we do for our staff. And, you know, as we're looking at revising many of our PDO and, and staff trainings in, in various areas, whether it's cultural competency or microaggression or sexual assault and harassment, that we build in a partnership with our communities so that their actual experiences in our schools are reflected in the training that we offer to make it much more um, grounded in the reality of our school system. Yes, we can absolutely look at uh, Finance Park as a summer. Uh, I had not thought of that before, but that'd be a great summer w uh, way to support students and learning. And then we'll, we'll continue to look at how we can help students who had some sort of virtual option this year have the physical experience in the future but as you said we have 40 middle schools and if they each take you know four days that's 160 school days right there so it is that that challenge but if we use more days than just school days like summer days 
then we could get more more students have the opportunity. Uh, and I know uh, Dr. Nixon from our Human Resource Department and Dr. McKnight, who are leading the reimagination in in the Human Resources Department, heard the testimony and will certainly be thinking about how we broaden and deepen our access to lots of different individuals across the community uh, for their expertise and their uh, what they have to share with our staff uh, in in many, many areas. So we, we understand and appreciate that uh, comment. Uh, Dr. Smith, I have a question to follow up on Ms. Mandrowski and Ms. Harris's discussion about the finance park. I'm wondering, uh, when you talked about uh, finance being embedded in our curriculum, I wonder is if when we start thinking about career and college readiness and more of a focus on career for some of our students, if we ought not to consider having an actual course for credit that would help support them in that area or, or better train them, let's say. Because I wonder if they're actually taking the courses where finance is embedded in it. So, as I said, we, we do have it embedded in the elementary, middle, and high school. And that's the strategy that was chosen a number of years ago by, I think somebody has their mic open. Uh, um, okay, it was chosen a number of years ago before I arrived by Montgomery County. At the same time, um, about half the school systems in the state chose a half credit high school course. And so we'll send you all of that background so you can kind of see what the, the standard is across the state. Um, some school systems chose elementary embedded activities and then a high school half credit. We do have a course in Montgomery County and we do have a percentage of students who take it as an elective and we'll send you that information. But it may be something that the board will want to take up as you think about um, the whole issue of career uh, ready and how college fits into that and how students really look at uh, what they want to do in life for work and then what is the lifestyle that is connected to that kind of work and the, the college requirements, the certification requirements. Many of those things do get addressed in a financial literacy course beyond what is addressed in the embedded standards based system that Montgomery County has. So we'll send you a lot of background on that, and then it may be something the board will want to talk about, uh, you know, late in a, in a few weeks or in a, a couple of months about taking a look at that as a uh, possible shift in the way that students uh, experience the high school curriculum. Thank you. Do I see any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to our next video with Laura Stewart. Einstein High School Cluster. Hello, my name is Laura Stewart, Acting Albert Einstein Cluster Coordinator. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the FY22 operating budget on behalf of our cluster. I understand how difficult it is to plan for the next year as we move into the next phase of schooling during the COVID-19 emergency. We urge our state and local leaders to fund the budget in order to keep staffing at FY21 levels. We must hold MCPS harmless from reduction in enrollment during the emergency. The political climate is also changing and this could affect immigration trends as well, which has an outsized effect on the Einstein cluster. We must not cut ESOL staff and we need to look at expanding services if possible. Our cluster is home to some of the highest rates of COVID-19, and this has created tremendous needs in the community. Our PTAs have stepped up by creating resource hubs and grocery store card drives. There, have been, there has been collaboration between the school staff, PPWs, and community organizations. The increased need to support families will not end this year. The whole community will need to come together for recovery in FY22. This emergency and all the trauma that our diverse student body has experienced has caused the need for mental health supports as well. We advocate for more psychologists, counselors, and social workers. In order to ensure that all children and families are supported, we urge you to implement the community schools model in all schools in our cluster. For instance, Sligo Middle School does not have a wellness center, yet they have the METS program, which will greatly benefit from more wraparound services. The community school model would help PPWs connect families with resources and PTA's involvement in this model 
could foster more collaboration with other organizations to support those efforts. When we do return to the physical classroom, it is also important that our school community feels safe. Please continue to install cameras that the school leaderships have requested. We would like this budget to include extra maintenance costs to keep the extra air filters needed in the COVID-19 environment up to date and monitored. Please include money to test the water for lead and Legionella because water sat in pipes due to less use. We also ask that you conduct individual school safety plans that include the above concerns, but also should include hand washing routines and other logistical issues that entails reopening during a pandemic. I would also like to highlight an opportunity to expand the use of the outdoors in FY21. Washington DC School Board has requested $4 million to fund outdoor learning opportunities because the outdoors is safer during a pandemic. Our cluster would also like to implement more use of outdoor space, especially for physical education and lunch. Both of these activities include higher risk for spreading the virus. Having more outdoor, outdoor learning opportunities could also benefit children who have been indoors more since the COVID-19 emergency has started. I sincerely hope you consider expanding outdoor learning in this budget. Lastly, we would like to support the Black and Brown Coalition's stance that it is essential that this budget set aside dedicated resources that are clearly identified and transparently locate, allocated to ensure a coordinated investment in redressing learning loss. I strongly urge you to work with the community to stand up equity hubs for our teenage students now using middle school and high school space in order to provide in-person support with those that have already lost one semester of learning. It is not too late, and these equity hubs may reduce extreme learning loss for teenagers, which could save future interventions that will need to be funded. I appreciate all the work you have done now to keep our kids safe and educated. We have learned to work together as a community in ways we have never done before. I look forward to continued collaboration and the Einstein Cluster is ready to work with MCPS and the greater community in order to assure that all kids have the opportunity to thrive. Thank you. Next is Chris Rutledge from the Wheaton High School Cluster. Thank you, President Wolf, Dr. Smith, and members of the Board of Education. I'm Chris Rutledge and I am the Wheaton Cluster Coordinator here tonight to represent the needs of the Wheaton Cluster Schools and also advocate for some of the more broad county-wide needs. Uh, I want to start with Wheaton High School. Wheaton High School asks that its softball field be completed in a prompt manner. Right now, that field is only dirt and weeds. Someday soon, the students will come back to school, and at that time, they will truly need a place for them to play. Lorderman Middle School makes a request for increased faculty for its dance and theater departments. Over the past few years, the theater sections have increased from eight to 11 and the dance sections from 15 to 19, but still the class sizes are as high as 35 in these classes. This is a performing arts magnet and thus we need adequate faculty in order to teach these classes. Leuterman also makes a point about needing additional staffing as in terms of a full-time counselor for its English language learners. Right now, about 220 of the Lorderman students are English language learners, and they just don't have what they need in order to support them, particularly during this pandemic. Uh, this is especially problematic because the one counselor they do have, they're sharing with three schools. So it really is very minimal time. Also asks if we can get a designated translator for uh, the many families that they have who are of themselves of limited language ability. Um, this position could be shared with nearby elementary schools to help do some of the burden, but it is so critical so that these families can participate. Parkland Middle School is asking for additional mental health care. Right now, they've this year alone have had several students hospitalized for suicidal ideation or for actually attempting suicide. We have to do better for these students. Uh, Brookhaven Elementary School is asking for additional water fountains to allow them to have water bottles rather than the disposable plastic water bottles students often carry around. We think this would be a great environmental bonus and benefit. Uh, well, Brookhaven is also asking for two additional security cameras to help protect the safety of the school. Once again, all the students are back in class. 
Uh, and they're also looking for materials and supplies to enable the students in order to create a rooftop garden and other outdoor space to really make it a much more environmentally friendly school. As I mentioned, we also want to talk about some of the countywide needs. We need to continue to work to increase the staff and faculty diversity and staff development in DEI, particularly around LGBTQ plus issues. We simply must meet students where they are. In terms of health and wellness, we need to fully fund the proposed budget and make sure that we are providing all of the schools the adequate PPE equipment they need so that when students do return, we can keep students and faculty and staff all very safe. Lastly, I wanna talk about staffing for all positions. Right now, there's a real challenge in terms of looking at the number of people that will, students will be coming back into the school and whether or not we can reduce staffing and we can't. We really do have to maintain current levels and not look to reduced staffing levels when students start to trickle back into the buildings. We need to make sure that students have everything they need and we stand ready to help you and be part of the solution when the time comes. Thank you again and have a good night. Next is Toria Simpson and Julia Finner, Montgomery County School Psychologist Association. Hello, my name is Julia Fenner. And I am Toria Simpson. We are speaking to you on behalf of the Montgomery County School Psychologists Association. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the fiscal year 2022 MCPS budget recommendations. MCSPA supports the proposed recommendation to add school psychologist positions in order to provide services to students in our county. However, present times highlight the urgent need for even more staffing than what has been recommended in order to address student mental health needs. Across our county, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempts have been on the rise since the beginning of the pandemic. Each of these areas requires specially trained mental health staff. School psychologists are uniquely qualified staff to provide these supports and much more. Our specialized training in mental health, learning, and behavior ensures that we are well-versed in providing a myriad of services. This includes direct intervention to students, consultation to teachers and families, social-emotional learning, crisis support, threat assessment, counseling collaboration with administrators to improve school-wide practices and policies, as well as identifying signs of learning strengths and needs and signs of mental health distress. Despite our unique training and skill sets, before the pandemic, school psychologists spent a large portion of their day in meetings, testing or writing reports to meet state and federal mandates. This too often resulted in students receiving less supports and interventions. These services are a very limited portion of what we are trained to do and is a reactive approach to student and school needs. Although we are trained to enact system level changes in supports, the level of participation in countywide initiatives is not feasible upon the return to school buildings, even if they are still necessary. Throughout the pandemic, school psychologists have spent a great deal of time involved in multiple initiatives. At the school level, we provide crisis response, social emotional lessons, consultation to staff and families, as well as individual counseling. In addition, we participate in meetings for students, including special education, child find, section 504 eligibility, and student well-being teams. At the county level, we have been essential in creating social emotional lessons and psychoeducational lessons, moving the mental health fair online, and participating on multiple work groups, including bargaining and return to school committees. And at the state level, many of our colleagues are involved in helping to pass legislation to improve academic and mental health opportunities for students in Maryland. Due to the length of the pandemic, students and families have dealt with a long-term crisis that has led to trauma, long-standing mental health needs, and other untold consequences. Research suggests that effects of trauma stay with children and adolescents long after the traumatic event concludes. Effects include an increased risk of psychological, behavioral, and emotional problems, substance abuse, low academic achievement, social maladjustment, and poor physical health. In order to effectively prepare for the needs of students upon the return to school, MCSPA is planning ahead and attempting to be proact uh, preventative. We anticipate that trauma, mental health problems, a lack of social connectedness, and even loss of instruction will mean that a return to schools will not mean a return to business as usual. We anticipate that mental health needs will remain high and require psychoeducation and intensive supports. We anticipate an increase in special education referrals 
and Section 504 eligibility, we as school psychologists will need to balance our present day roles with our pre-pandemic roles. This can only be accomplished by adding more school psychologists to our system and lowering our ratios. The National Association of School Psychologists recommends a ratio of one psychologist to 500 students in order to provide comprehensive psychological services. Based on the fall 2020 enrollment numbers, the MCPS school-based ratio is 1 to 1,574, more than triple the recommended ratio. As enrollment numbers increase when students return to school next year, we are well aware that this ratio must continue to decrease in order to provide direct mental health supports to our students, including counseling. MCSPA is grateful to receive increased positions each year in order to continue providing school psychology services that are comprehensive. However, there is an urgency to address student mental health needs during this time and the return to school. We implore the board to consider the need for additional school psychologists and present needs of students, as well as mental health needs due to trauma on the horizon. Thank you for your time, this opportunity to voice MCSPA's input and your support for continued increases in staffing. Next is Chris Barkley from 1977 to Action Group. My name is Christopher Barclay. I represent the 1977 to Action Group. Every year, advocates like ourselves come to the Board of Education to implore you to adopt a budget that reflects our children's needs. This year is unique. This year, we come before you in the midst of a global pandemic. Teaching and learning has changed in ways that we could not have predicted. Students have not been in classrooms with teachers since March of last year, and some will, will not be back in buildings again until March of this year at the earliest. In this period of virtual learning, many of our children have fallen through the cracks. Of the students who have not engaged in virtual learning, close to 25% of them are Black. Failing grades in courses like ninth grade English have skyrocketed. National studies say that students of color could be six to 12 months behind by the end of June 2021. The picture is bleak and how we do public education will never be the same. In the context of this, the 1977-2 Action Group believes it is important to address the following areas in the fiscal 22 operating budget. This budget needs clear and dedicated resources to combat the learning losses black students have experienced before and during the pandemic. The budget needs to explain how current and new teacher positions will be used to address the existing and projected learning gaps across grade levels. The budget needs to support a staffing structure that assigns the most effective school leaders and teachers where they are needed the most. MCPS students need access to rigorous and relevant coursework across all grades. Resources must be dedicated to ensure students are reading on grade level and must be paired with a renewed commitment to significantly improved math instruction, especially at the elementary level. At the same time, MCPS has to improve and increase its capacity to deliver high quality career technology education programming. MCPS needs to recruit, train, and retain a teaching core that better reflects and can relate to the student body. While doing that, we need to make sure that the staff in our schools and all of our buildings know our children and the cultures from which they come. As MCPS prepares for students to return to schools whenever that is possible, we have to reimagine safety and security in our schools and commit to restorative practices. This time away from school buildings has an impact on our students, and we need to be prepared to adjust in ways that support our young people's growth and development and not simply expect them to comply to rules. Our children are being impacted by this pandemic in ways that we don't even know. 
and being forced to go to school online. MCPS has to continue to restructure itself to meet our children where they are and prepare them for success in the future. We cannot do this with a vague and uninspired plan. It must be done with innovation, courage, and a willingness to put children first. The 1977-2 Action Group looks forward to working with MCPS to fashion the future of public education in Montgomery County. Thank you. Next is Janelle Wong from the Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network, member of the Black and Brown Coalition. Good evening, my name is Janelle Wong and I am here as a co-director of MoCo PAN, the Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network. We are a coalition member of the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity and Excellence, and we support the goals, agenda, and asks of the coalition. The Black and Brown Coalition's leadership has made clear that our priority is addressing unequal learning loss on top of decades of racial and economic inequalities in MCPS. I would like to emphasize three points. The first is that the problems we face in MCPS are systemic. And so must the solutions be. Tutoring plans and resources must consider systemic barriers to access, including transportation, food security, and racial segregation. High dosage tutoring must be accompanied by other systemic changes, including recruiting teachers of color, providing real and consistent support for those teachers, expansion of the minority scholars program, and assignment of the most effective teachers and leaders to serve those students who face the most significant learning loss. We believe that resource equity can drive systemic change, but it is not yet reflected in the budget. Second, while we recognize that these are unprecedented times, we urge the board to consider the unique power of the budget, not just to recover, but to fundamentally reprioritize resources. To recover is to return to the status quo for which teacher quality, student preparation and student outcomes varied widely by race and economic status. Reprioritization and reallocation starts with the budget decisions you are making now. A change from the status quo related to racial and economic equity is not yet apparent in the budget. Third, accountability should be supported with both processes and data. Accountability begins with coupling the budget to the strategic plan and implementing annual process improvements to achieve and measure progress in removing systemic roadblocks. All of these measures are supported by the collection of high quality data. The Asian American community is diverse, and if the data from marking period one were disaggregated to reveal the distinct Asian national origin groups within the district, it would no doubt show that disparities related to learning loss vary within our community by both ethnic group and farm status. We urge you to put into place these accountability processes and data. MCPS has long been regarded as excellent, but a school system characterized by deep inequalities cannot be excellent. Excellence starts with equity, that is providing students what they need based on justice principles, and that must be reflected in the budget. Thank you. Next is Sarah McMillan from the NAACP Parents Council. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah McMillan, a 2011 graduate of Montgomery Blair's Magnet Program and a 2015 graduate of MIT with a degree in mechanical engineering. I'm here to ask you to look back at the $25 billion plus dollars taxpayers have given MCPS since I graduated. Look back at how long Blair and Poolsville Magnet graduates are the rare MCPS students prepared for rigorous math and science courses at a four-year college. And look back at the 55% of students of color and farms graduates who are unable to multiply, divide, and understand algebra. Now look forward. An equal number of students will be in the same place if you recommend the same budget spending pattern for 2022. A pair of Oxford professors project that 50% of jobs will be automated during to current MCPS students' working years. Those without technical degrees are at higher risk of being stuck in poor paying jobs, 
if any are available. Even before the pandemic, Black wealth was projected to go to zero in 2053. Hispanic wealth was projected to go to zero in 2073. Ask yourself if you should give MCPS a blank check to spend another $2.7 billion to repeat the same mistakes. When I was a student, I testified about the need to provide math teachers more professional development so they could be more effective. The peer tutoring program I started in 2009 with 20 other Blair Magnet students proved that students could and were eager to learn math. However, many of their teachers just did not have the skills to teach them math in a way that made them think and not just calculate. Some version of this conversation happens every year, but still, most MCPS students struggle to pass freshman calculus. This is on your watch. Say no to a blank check. Require the budget to be reallocated to at least fix the longstanding problems of students not understanding math. Reallocate the budget to provide more professional development, staff time, and substitutes to make the change. Have the budget reflect the priorities recommended by the ERS study and agreed to by the Black and Brown Coalition. Automation, globalization, and income inequality are barriers to MCPS graduates having fruitful careers and building wealth. Don't be complicit. Next is Daniela Helton. Good evening, Dr. Smith and members of the board. My name is Daniela Helton and I'm the school counselor at Little Bennett Elementary. This is my 17th year as an MCPS elementary school counselor. I'm a Latina and an advocate for school counselors and children. As a counselor, I have an increased understanding of trauma and how it affects children. It is no surprise that the pandemic has created anxiety for all of us but it has also planted seeds of worry and concern in our children, and each child is coping differently. Some are internalizing it, others are showing strong emotions, and many are exhibiting unhealthy, compulsive, and repetitive reactions. Children will continue to process the pandemic, and once we return to school, other emotional challenges will arise. Our elementary schools must be ready and equipped with an adequate number of school counselors to support the mental health needs of our students and establish a healthy emotional foundation for student success. Most recently, talk of equity has also been at the forefront, and I believe elementary counselors are a key factor in breaking down barriers related to this topic. It is known that black and brown students are disproportionately disciplined and represented in the criminal justice system. Why is this? We need to take a deeper dive into understanding this cause. What we do know is that children with genetic markers of trauma are at risk and are more likely to participate in risky behaviors and poor decision making. We also know that early intervention helps children improve their abilities and learn new skills. Children who are engaging in disciplinary and criminal-like behaviors in middle and high school also have concerns in the early years. Helping students at the onset of these behaviors and having the necessary supports and people to talk to them will result in a better outcome for student success. Useful practices such as restorative justice take time as well as mental health staffing to be a benefit. As a result, we can get ahead of these problems in order to assist youth at an influential age with an increased number of elementary school counselors. Currently, I support 650 students and I am the only counselor in my building. Equity is giving everyone what they need to succeed. Students deserve an equal opportunity to receive mental health supports, regardless of economic status, race, or color. Please consider using the 250 to one student counselor ratio that is currently used for the middle and high schools, also at the elementary level. Thank you. Next is Melissa McKenna.
Good evening. My name is Melissa McKenna. For the record, this testimony was recorded last week on January 14th and may already be out of date. Please see my written testimony, especially regarding special education. I'm speaking to you this evening as a proud member of the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity and Excellence. I support the testimony last week of Byron Johns, Diego Uraburu, and our student representatives, Lauren and Andrew. Believe it or not, I do have thank yous. The community and the coalition took action in September to begin standing up educational equity hubs through funding from the Children's Opportunity Fund. Thank you very much for your support to scale the 11 original hubs to now more than 40 locations and approximately 1,500 students. These have been invaluable to our black, brown, and low-income families. Thank you, Ms. Mondrowski, for asking on January 14th about what can be done now to support students struggling with virtual learning. As the time till in-person school continues to be extended, my first ask is to continue Equity Hub funding support, then plan for and allocate resources specifically to return to MCPS classes. Another coalition ask is the provision of intensive, effective one-on-one -on -one or one-to-small group tutoring support, for example, every day or year-round, to those students who show the greatest learning loss. There should be planning now, hopefully, detailing how this learning loss recovery will be accomplished, either as after-school supports, Saturday school, or summer school. Often such support is rolled into the whole of the budget murkiness. Learning recovery loss requires a more robust and holistic approach. Beyond dedicating resources to this goal, we, the community, and the coalition are asking you to clearly identify and transparently allocate resources to ensure a coordinated investment. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for accommodating more than 40,000 students in summer school last year. We need to prepare now to also use this summer as a vital time for recovery. Those efforts will certainly show the commitment of MCPS to equity and will be readily apparent in specific budget line items. Personally, I am thrilled to see 111, okay, 105, new positions and six retained LFI positions for special ed. Thank you, Mrs. O'Neill and others for your continued questions and concerns for our differently abled students. Considerable resources will be required to provide all the services lost this year. I appreciate the intention and planning, but likely these positions will just be on paper. In the best of times, special education teachers, paros, and therapists were in extremely short to plot supply. Honestly, this is a placeholder budget while you wait for more information. Now, more than ever, it is important for you to show how funds will be spent. Without a substantial infusion of cash, hint, not from sports betting, the blueprint for education is done on arrival. Shifting funding expectations from the state to the county is a risky prospect. Only Ms. Evans mentioned MOE funding during the MCEA legislative reception January 8th. Many counties are in more dire circumstances than we are, and I am concerned that MOE will be waived at least this year as a result. Spend wisely, and please show your work. Thank you. Last is Andre Frazier and Farah Frazier from Cabin John Middle School. Dear President Wolf and members of the Board of Education, my name is Andre Fraser, and my wife and I have two sons in the Montgomery County Public School System, one at Cabin John Middle School and the other at Thomas Wooten High School. And I have my son Farai with me today, and he's going to share with you the impact of virtual learning on children. And while I realize that we're in the middle of a pandemic, I still realize that Maryland of the 50 states is one of the has not opened up uh, public schools to, to public, students, public school students as yet. And the reality is that the COVID-19 pandemic is really providing a huge challenge and virtual learning is definitely not working out for the uh, children. I'm very concerned about the mental well-being of the children from being isolated. Also, there is long-term impact from them sitting in front of a computer, eye strain. There's also ergonomic concerns that I have for them sitting in, in uh, on desks and chairs that aren't designed for uh, younger people, younger students. So with that, I'll pass over to my son, Farai, to give his um, testimony. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Farai Frazier. I'm a seventh grader at Cabin John Middle School, and I'm here today because I think that the Board of Education should listen to kids more before they go on to make decisions. I'm concerned because the decisions about when to reopen schools are being made by adults instead of kids, even though that decision is affected to kids more than adults. 
As a middle schooler, I believe that we should return to in-person school or at least give other students an option to go to hybrid school at least a few times a week because online school simply doesn't work out. For example, we get no type of student interaction and no time to spend with our friends. We can't really ask the teachers for help sometimes because the chat is disabled. Sometimes when you try to private message a teacher, if you have a question or don't understand something during class, that may not work because the teacher is in the middle of a lesson while other students may have questions as well. And even when the teachers try to get us to interact in breakout rooms, most of the time, kids won't talk to each other or even turn on their cameras. And even when kids do try to talk to each other, they won't respond, so it makes it feel like speaking up isn't worth it. Online learning also makes a lot of kids unmotivated to do their work because they don't get to see our friends to keep them happy or talk to our teachers either. Because we actually do like our teachers. And when you're in person, when you have to turn in work in front of the whole class, if you don't have it, it's a feeling of embarrassment that'll keep you motivated to make sure you turn it in. With online school, kids always have to get up in the morning. With in-person school, kids always have to get up in the morning and prepare themselves because they want to look nice at school. Now some kids don't even bother to get out of bed. And, yeah. Keep going. Some kids don't even bother to get out of bed for class that's kind of depressing. Some kids don't even bother to comb or brush their hair, brush their teeth, change clothes, or do anything of the sort. It has changed a lot of people's moods. Some of my friends who are the most perky and energetic now just feel down and they just aren't happy anymore. A lot of us were excited about going back to school in February, but now we're disappointed to learn that it's been pushed back to March. I hope that this is not a plan to keep pushing this off to the school year is over because kids really need to get back in school because we are miserable. I know the survey for parents to get their opinion about reopening the schools, but no one ever spoke to us kids who really need to, learn, really need to know about this because it's affecting us once again. I think they should give kids a survey to see how we might feel about going back to person in school for at least a few days a week. You might be surprised what you hear. Thank you for listening. Okay, at this time, we'll take board questions. Does anyone have a question? Ms. Madrowski. Yeah, thank you. Um, two quick things, um, but, but first, I, I also want to thank our, our student for um, testifying and our students in the beginning. Um, we always love to hear from our students. Um, two things, first of all, um, going back a bit, linkages to learning. Um, at Twinbrook, are we, I know I've asked about this in the past, but are we working with the city at all to try and see what we can do to establish something there? We were working before the, the pandemic, I have to say, we haven't done any work since that time on that particular effort, but we will pick it up. We're also looking at all of the places we could place a linkage, linkages to learning and or a community health center especially as we renovate and build a uh, new school. So those things are in the works, uh, but we'll have to go back and pick up and see uh, what we can get done given the county's budget crisis right now, because they do fund uh, a lot of those efforts, so. Yeah, I know. I just, I also know that the city, you know, is interested in partnering with us if, if at all possible. And it's definitely an area that's gonna need additional support, so. Anything we, will, we will definitely take Mayor Newton up on her offer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then my other question, going back to my um, previous question about um, financial literacy during summer school, um, students, I'm assuming, well, I shouldn't, I guess I was assuming that students would be able to take any class uh, during summer school that's offered for summer school. Um, but recently I heard of, about someone who goes to Magruder, a student at Magruder who wanted to take a geometry class during summer school that's offered for Churchill. Are, are we not going to be offering summer school classes kind of across the district or are we going to be doing them based on specific schools? No, we offer them across the district. And so we'll have to look into that and see what exactly was the circumstance there because we do offer the courses across the system and we'll find out what the, the deal was, but we don't want anyone to not have access to a course because of which high school they go to or any school they yeah. go to. Yeah. No, I appreciate that because I know people are asking about loss of credits and stuff like that. So thank you. Are there any, um, Ms. Harris? Yes, thank you. I, I really appreciate how so much of the testimony that we heard tonight and in the previous operating budget hearing focused on a sort of a global concern for 
uh, the impact that COVID shutdown has had on our students. So picking up on some of the themes we just heard, I'm wondering if we can get a sense of um, exactly how many ESOL counselors we do have in the school system, where they're located and to which schools they're assigned. Um, because I do think our ESOL students are among those who are gonna be struggling the most with learning recovery and um, whose learning was, is probably been most impacted by the lack of that in-person piece. Um, also looking at um, a lot of the testimony that we've heard about the role of psychologists and the mental wellness and needs of our students generally, and also the trauma that we know many of our students and staff have suffered during this time of shutdown. Um, and you know, talking about the the recommended ratio of students to psychologists, and the ratio that MCPS currently attains, and wondering if we could do some looking at what it would take for us as a system to achieve the one psychologist to 500 student ratio that's recommended, um, and it's sort of a, an intellectual exercise about what we might need to sacrifice, because I know this is not a time really to be talking about what we can add. Uh, so earlier the question was asked about how many ESOL counselors, so we will definitely provide that, as well as the second part of the question was what is the, the training that's provided to uh, those counselors who are not specifically designated as ESOL counselors around ESOL programming. So we'll send you both of those responses uh, for this. In terms of psychologists, it would be about, we'd have, to, we'd have to triple our number of current psychologists. And so we'll send you that number and the cost to give the board some idea of you know, what the uh, scope and scale of that sort of trade-off would equal. Okay. Does anyone else have, Dr. Daka, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I just wanted to say that um, what struck me about the uh, testimony tonight is that there's so much unity among the organizations. They're working together on the kinds of needs that we have. I appreciate the advocacy of uh, Mayor Newton and uh, Council Member Ashton on linkage to learning that they will be working with us, but also with the County Council, because I think a lot of the funding comes from there. And everybody uh, is concerned about ESOL and having enough ESOL staff, but I think there are a couple of programs that we've talked about before at Highland and, and Gaithersburg Elementary School, which means that regular teachers are also responsible for ESOL students. And when we talk about the recovery program, uh, and that was also kind of a, a unified response from our speakers, I really uh, want to emphasize that it does have to be systematized. It has to be organized. It just can't be this school does it one way, that school does it another way. It just won't work that well that way. And uh, uh, we appreciate what the psychologists are saying. Uh, we are very concerned about that. And I, I guess staff can tell you what they're doing uh, in order to alleviate that. And the dirty energy and the diesel buses. I think we need to get um, Mr. Walker, uh, Todd, to Watkins, to uh, remind us of, about the purchasing of the electric buses and how much it costs and how we have to work with, um, an, uh, with an organization in order to do this, because that's what they're doing at other schools. I think they said Fairfax was getting seven, but they're doing it in conjunction with uh, a private uh, agency. So thank you all for your um, for your uh, conversation tonight and for your requests. I will not use asks, it's requests. Ms. O'Neill. Certainly, the issue about summer school and uh, credit, I mean, and students being able to recover learning loss. Um, I know we had 40 some odd thousand students last summer engaged in summer school. I'm specifically concerned about the high school. You know, uh, Ms. Mondraski raised the issue about uh, geometry. Can we look 
uh, retrospectively at what the high school offerings were or participation in general? I know we have regional summer school programs and then local school programs. We've always had that, but could we sort of get you know, how, how did that work last summer? And, you know, what is the thinking going on for this summer? And then the other piece is, as people were speaking about the financial literacy, you know, um, I, I know we had a conversation about, you know, the MCPS requirements for graduation are different from the state. You know, we have an additional semester required for PE. We have um, an additional year for math as a requirement for graduation, 15 additional hours in student service learning. And Dr. Smith, you mentioned the uh, financial um, literacy program that MCPS decided to embed it, you know, over the three levels of learning. But I think some of that was a concern about, you know, we still want students to have the ability to explore and what, you know, but it, I think it speaks to the need to look at our overall MCPS high school graduation credit requirements. Yes, we will send the, uh, a detailed breakdown of last summer what was offered, where it was offered, and uh, the participation. Uh, in terms of graduation uh, requirements, that's both, uh, you're, and you're absolutely right, uh, Ms. O'Neill, I think anywhere they did decide not to make financial literacy a credit requirement at the high school level, it was to protect uh, students' options to take multiple other courses, so that's always that tension. And then uh, in terms of graduation requirements, uh, we are doing an analysis now for our current class of 2021 so that we can come back to you and share with you early in second semester the circumstance as we did last uh, uh, early May, actually, late April, to make sure that we are not creating barriers this year for students to graduate that we don't need to create and, and maintain during this pandemic. So we will be back to you with that information about graduation in the short term. And then I think the certainly the board always can and should look at graduation requirements in the longer term uh, in terms of the, the changing society, the changing uh, content of courses, all of those things. But we'll be doing it for the class of 20. We're, we are doing it for the class of 21 right now as we speak. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands. So on behalf of the board, I want to thank everyone who submitted testimony for tonight. I'm especially pleased when any students participate. So we'd like to thank all of our students. You all did an excellent job. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye.